All right, now that we have looked at simple wireless LAN systems, let's go on to cellular systems in particular. Let's look at the state-of-the-art 5G NR standard. Now, the, all these cellular systems can be dauntingly complex, and if you try to pull open a book, you could just get very frightened looking at all the terminology and details. What I'm going to give you here is a kind of 50,000-foot view of these systems and break it down and give you the high level concepts and walk you through the key ideas to give you a conceptual framework for what is happening and i'm hoping by the end you'll actually get the basic principles in operation so with that in mind the idea in cellular systems or in particular cellular OFDM systems which were started in 4G is that the transmissions are scheduled at the base station. So here we have a base station or in 5G terminology called a GNB and remember that is transmitting to multiple UEs. So we've shown two streams of data one in purple and one in green. Now the idea is that all transmissions occur sort of in three phases. There's an assignment phase, which tells you the UE that um, a bunch of data, first of all, that what data, who the data user is intended for, or the user identity, whether this is a schedule for the uplink or a downlink. It will also indicate the time frequency resources for the data. It will also have the MCS, and then also the time frequency resources for where the UE is supposed to acknowledge that data and all sorts of other formatting decisions. After it sends that assignment, it can then send the data itself. The UE can now, because it has all the information, knows where to find it, can decode it, and then also check something like a CRC, and then depending on whether it passed or failed, can send back an ACK. Now this gives a lot of flexibility um, in the transmissions. Not only can you select the MCS, you can select the uh, actual time frequency resources, and you can also pick which users are being scheduled at which times. There's a whole body of work on trying to optimize these schedulers. We don't have a chance to get into it in this course, but check that information out if you are interested. All right, let's go a little bit more into the details of how this works. The key idea for understanding scheduling, at least in 5G NR, is to understand the basic unit in time and frequency for scheduling. It's called a resource block. We already saw that in the previous lab. So a resource block, just as a re recollection, is one um, slot in time. And in the 5G NR standard, there's it's highly configurable. So it ranges between one millisecond to one half to one quarter to one eighth and so on of a millisecond. It is also 12 subcarriers in frequency, but the subcarrier spacing will increase as that slot time goes down. And each assignment will be an integer number of these resource blocks in a slot. All right. So that is how we understand time frequency resources. Now, to actually make the scheduling work, there's actually a couple of different channels that are needed. Let me just talk about the really basic important ones. And first, let's talk about the downlink. So the downlink, remember, is the transmissions from the base station or G node B to the UE. There's two basic channels to keep in mind. There's what's called, a, a problem with this field is that there's just a lot of acronyms. So you will eventually get used to it if you uh, stick around to this. Otherwise, you can just make yourself a cheat sheet or something like that. All right. So the important channels in the downlink are the, what's called the physical downlink shared channel. And that is basically the channel for data. It's called shared because it's actually being shared amongst multiple UEs because different times and frequencies, different UEs can be scheduled onto that channel. The other key channel is what's called the physical downlink control channel or PDCCH. And that actually has the assignments and namely telling you which time frequency resources are being allocated to the UE. Similarly, in the uplink, there are also two key channels. There's what's called the physical uplink shared channel, which is the analog to the PDSCH, and that will have the uplink data that the UE is sending. The assignments 
for the uplink I still go on the downlink because remember it is the GNOB that is the master of the universe that is scheduling everyone but we do need one other channel in the uplink which is called the physical uplink control channel that has all sorts of functioning purposes in the cellular standards but this will be used here I'll talk about for two reasons. One is to send scheduling requests to tell the base station that it has data to transmit and also to send back acknowledgments and we'll look in detail about all of these. All right, let's take a look at what happens for the downlink and uplink scheduling in these channels. So what typically is the procedure is like this. You have, uh, starts off, let's look at the downlink first, a PDCCH which is the assignment channel, and this indicates to a UE that there is data to be transmitted to it. So we'll have all sorts of information, which has another acronym called the downlink control information, and that will tell, among other things, where to find the data channel, its format, like its MCS selection, and which UE it is intended for. So the UE will then read that data but also in this PDCCH, it will indicate where to send the ACK. So after the UE has decoded this data, it can then send the ACK on the assigned resource. The ACK will generally go on the uplink control channel, but it could also go on the uplink share channel, and I'm not going to go into those details. In the uplink, it's somewhat similar. The PDCCH, again, indicates an uplink resource, and the UE will then transmit on the uplink, and as for a moment, reason that I will explain momentarily, it does not need an ACK to be transmitted. All right, one more detail is about the MCS option. So in the, it's basically the same idea of any system with MCS options. You have discrete options that range with changing the modulation order, like QPSK, 16 QAM, and so on, as well as the target code rates. And you saw some of these already in your lab. Um, there's just a few more of these than what happened in the 5G standard. So by Varying the MCS, you vary the number of bits in the transmission, and the basic uh, that set of bits will be called a transport block. All right, let's just make sure we understand how to compute this transport block size. Suppose, for example, we have a slot with 125 microseconds, and it gets a downlink grant with the following. So let's say that grant spend spans 10 resource blocks. There could be many more in the system, but maybe it decides only to give allocate 10 to that UE. And it uses MCS 12. So in that chart I've just pulled here, that is 16 QAM at a code rate of 434 divided by 1024, to be very precise. And in the resource block, remember, you don't get all the uh, uh, resource elements, let's say about 10 of them are used for overhead, like PDCCH and reference signals and so on. All right, so then you could ask what is the transport size and the instantaneous data rate. That is a super easy calculation. You just do it like this. You know that each resource block is 12 subcarriers wide in frequency and 14 OFDM symbols in time. So there are 168 of these resource elements. But we're using 10 under this assumption for various overheads, so we have 158 left for data. So if we have 158 left for data, I can look at the spectral efficiency, and that is, in this case, going to be, oh, it's not, oh, there it is, 1.6953, but you could have gotten that by taking four, um, uh, fourth order modulation times 434 divided by 1024. And we get 10 of these resource blocks, so we get about 26.8 kilobits. And then if I ask what the instantaneous data rate, well, I'm getting that data bit in this slot time, so I'd be getting about 21 megabits per second in this hypothetical example. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about what is a transport block and how many bits it would have. Let's look a little bit more 
detail at the downlink scheduling process. So in the downlink, imagine a packet arrives to the base station. It actually arrives from something called a core network, which maybe we'll have a chance to talk about when we talk about cellular systems at the end. But for imagine right now, it comes from the network, arrives at this base station. And the base station knows that this packet has to be sent to this particular UE. So what it needs to do first is it makes a scheduling decision and it sends a PDCCH assignment indicating to the UE that it wants to send data. And it also indicates where that data is going to be sent on the PDSCH. Hopefully the UE sees this and then we'll try to decode that data. Also on the PDCCH, it indicated to the UE where to send the ACK and let's say in this case, it comes up on the uplink control channel, and the UE will then send an ACK or an ACK. Now, based on this, it can now look again at whether it needs to send new data or to retransmit the old data, or maybe it's just done and it stops. In this case, I've illustrated here, it makes that scheduling decision and decides to send new data, which could be a next transmission in a sequence or a retransmission, again with a PDCH and a PDSCH, and eventually that data will get to the UE. So at super high level, it's pretty simple. There's a lot of details if you want to read and study the standard, but this will give you the basic starting point. All right, now let's take a look at the uplink. The uplink has a few little twists to it. For one thing, well, let's just see what happens when uplink data arrives at the UE. Remember that the UE just can't start transmitting because all transmissions are scheduled by the base station. The base station is the master of the universe. So it needs to make what is called a scheduling request. It basically tells the UE base station hey, I have data to be sent. And that could be sent, for example, on this physical uplink control channel. There are actually a lot of ways that the uh, UE can indicate this. There's also something called a buffer status report. I'm not going to get into the details. That's not important. Basic idea is just that it needs to be scheduled. Now, the base station doesn't have to schedule the UE. It is the master. It has to serve lots of UEs but let's hope that eventually it does schedule the UE. When it does that, it will tell the UE, give a UE what's called an uplink grant, again on that physical downlink control channel. And this will indicate to the UE that it's been granted and tells it where to send this uplink data. That is what time and frequency resources to use for this physical uplink shared channel. And the UE will then send its data on that control channel, on that data channel, sorry. The base station will then try to decode this and it can already know whether it passes or fails. If it fails, it doesn't need an act like the downlink. It can just go ahead and reschedule the UE and tell it, hey, transmit that again. Or it could say, oh, I actually know that you still have more data left to transmit and it could also again schedule say hey transmit some more data in either case if the ue could transmit again and eventually again the ue data will get to the base station which can then forward it on to the core network all right um let me just talk a little bit more in details. This PDCCH channel is very, very configurable like all the 5G NR um, channels. So you basically some kind of trade off of how much overhead you want to allocate to the PDCCH versus how much um, flexibility you have in scheduling. If you have a lot of allocation to the PDCCH, you can make it A, very robust, and B, schedule very a lot of users at the same time. On the other hand, of course, that eats into your data. There's a somewhat complicated process by which this resource allocation is given. It's done in something called corsets. I absolutely don't need to do understand it for this high level. But if you're interested, MATLAB actually has this great set of videos and one of them I've just put a link here called the PDCCH mapping to corset and it also shows you how to use the 5G toolbox to actually visualize where the PDCCH is allocated so for example in this case here you have a set of corsets here on the green and then the PDC PDSCH here is in blue so check that out if you want to get into all the details 
couple more things I need to talk about. One thing is that you need what are called multiple ARQ processes. Actually, they're called hybrid ARQ or HARC. I'm going to explain that hybrid where it comes from at the end of this unit, but so we'll keep that in mind. So here's the problem. So transmissions, that cycle from transmissions to acts to um, scheduling involves some delay. First of all, you take some time to transmit the data, it takes the time receiver, some time to decode it, and then it will take some time to actually send the acknowledgement and for that acknowledgement to be decoded before there can be another transmission of that data. In the meantime, you may not want to waste all these uh, resources. So what you can do to get around this is do what's called a multi-process hybrid ARQ. So the idea is this. You transmit some uh, packet, or uh, say in the first process, packet one, but while this is getting decoded and the ACK is sent back, you can start another packet. And you can start another and another, and you have, in this case, four of these processes going on in parallel. And then finally this comes back, and then it can start uh, processing this. Now. The actual 5G NR standard is super flexible. You can schedule the you can schedule a configurable number of hybrid ARQ processes up to 16. You can transmit them in any order, and uh, it will allow you to do all of this. This is again a huge area of optimization to build a scheduler to take advantage of this. I'm not going to have a chance to go into all this optimization theory for this, but. Please uh, check it out if you're interested. All right. With that in mind, I'm going to actually though have you do a little exercise. Again, check it out. The in-class exercises on the GitHub site. What I want you to do is really do a very simple hybrid ARQ simulation just so you kind of get to the understanding of the detailed mechanisms of how these hybrid ARQ processes work. So you're going to take a set of um, transport blocks and then you're going to have them go over a um, highly simplified version of a channel where they fail with some probability and then you'll see the order in which they finally get decoded. So go ahead and do this. It's really just a bookkeeping exercise but it'll give you, after you do this, I think you'll really understand how hybrid ARQ, at least at this high level, works and then you can go on to the next unit.